Okay, everyone, welcome to this morning's talk back. Uh, I'm Richard Hurskwisty, Director of Programming, and this is the second of our three talkbacks. The final one is tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. here in this room, and it's going to be on transmedia and virtual reality documentaries. Uh, transmedia documentarian uh, Helen Michelle is here. She's going to be presenting as well as Brad Lichtenstein, who is going to demo his virtual reality uh, documentary about um, women uh, in uh, health clinics encountering abortion protesters, uh, uh, taking the documentary footage and turning it into a virtual reality experience. And you're going to be able to um, sample and try out the demo if you come tomorrow, or several of you will, as many as we can take. So. Uh, I want to just thank Southern Oregon Film and Media, SOFAM, for the expo they've organized outside. Let people know about it. It's going to be on all day until 3 p.m. Um, I also want to thank the uh, SOU's Digital Media Center, which is recording uh, this and our other talkbacks so that you're going to be able to see these panels through our website online um, later on. Thank you, DMC. Um, well, I'm so um, thrilled and honored that we have such an illustrious panel to uh, discuss the topic of uh, women making independent movies. And uh, part of the attraction, uh, I think, is uh, the incredible moderator we were able to get for <laughs> this. Um, and that we're honoring this year Women Make Movies, um, the distribution company. So Women Make Movies, which is the leading distributor of women's film and video in the US, um, was founded in the mid-70s. But its executive director since 1983 has been Deborah Zimmerman, who is here. Thank you. Um, and uh, Deborah speaks about this topic and has done panels on this topic all over the world. And um, I have attended several of them. And she always makes the topic fresh and brings new perspectives to it. And that is why I'm thrilled that she's here to, because uh, the topic never stops being relevant, unfortunately. Uh, but at the same time, um, the, 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 um, the, this is a very exciting moment, I think, right now in women's filmmaking and reflected in the program this year. So again, I want to thank you for, for doing this. I'll turn the mic over now to Deborah Zimmerman. Thanks, Richard. And thank you all for that wonderful applause. Um, we like it. <laughs> I'm so thrilled to be here at Ashland. I do workshops um, as well as lectures all over the world. And I say, um, it's said that Ashland is a really great festival for filmmakers. And now I know that it really is. Um, In fact, there's somebody here who told me today that uh, she has a film here, Sandy Perlmutter, and she's here because of the workshop that I gave and how I spoke about festival strategy in Ashland, so I'm very glad. And what could be wrong with the festival that gives you Bloody Marys before a panel? Um, and even better, the password for the internet is relax. So, so this is going to be a really fun, fun panel. We're all going to just really relax. Um, I'll just tell you a couple of things about Women Make Movies, and then I'll have some opening remarks. And then I'm going to introduce each of the amazing panelists together, um, e I'm sorry, individually. I uh, ask them to tell us a bit about their work, and then we're going to have hopefully a lively discussion, which we'll be able to take part in about the current state of affairs. And that's all going to be done in 90 minutes. Um, so. But we'll, we'll rock through it. Um, so Women Make Movies is a nonprofit social enterprise that's been around since 1972. We are the largest distributor of films by and, by and about women actually in the world. Um, and we have almost 600 films in our collection. We also have a production assistance program where we assist women filmmakers uh, in getting their films from concept to completion. We're really proud that uh, in 10 of the last 11 years, we only missed one. Uh, filmmakers from Women Make Movies have been nominated or won Academy Awards, including Citizen Four last year, and Charmaine Charmaine Obaid's film, uh, A Girl on the River, this year. Um, here at Ashland, we're really proud. I, I think I've missed it. I may have even missed, but we have seven or eight films um, 
that either came through our production assistance program or that we distribute, including Sonita, which is screening tonight, um, and On Beauty, which uh, Joanna made. Um, also from our production assistance program, Trapped, Camera Person, The Fits, Norman Lear, another version of you. Um, we also distribute Barbara Hammer's films, and we actually have two films by men that are screening in the festival. That's a long story. You can ask me later. Um, <laughs> In Pursuit of Silence and Pink Boy. Um, so we're, we're really proud of, of all of our filmmakers and we really love that uh, we had nothing to do with this election, but uh, that Richard chose all of these films. Um, I also just want to say, because Sandy reminded me before, Sandy, where are you? Raise your hand just so that everybody knows who you are. Oh, she didn't show after all that. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, she'll be sorry. Um, <laughs> that we do webinars and workshops. Uh, we've recently expanded our workshops in New York to be webinars, and we're actually having one this Thursday coming up with Tom Oyer from the Academy Awards, who's gonna talk about uh, qualifying your film for the Academy Awards. We also have another one coming up for fiction filmmakers on screenplay writing with uh, Susan Kugel. And we have Meet the Industry events for those of you in New York with HBO and Vimeo's new Share the Screen initiative. Um, so please check out our website, WM WMM dot com uh, and you can get a listing of those as well as sign up for our newsletter can't help it I'm a marketer and a promoter what can I do I'm usually really bad at that but I took notes this time um, so uh, as Richard kind of said it's um, it's the best of times or maybe he said it's the best of times I'm gonna say it's the best of times and the worst of times and I actually looked up the quote it's Charles D Dickens of course um, but Here's the whole thing. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven and we were all going direct the other way. And for me, that is uh, where we're at right now in terms of, of women's filmmaking. It is the best of times, um, except for when women were making films in Hollywood before Hollywood became a business, <clears throat> back before 1920. But there's more money for, uh, particularly for documentaries uh, with Netflix and other platforms. There's more, there's actual investment uh, in documentary through impact partners. There are more funders, Cinereach, Catapult, Chicken and Egg. There are more initiatives that are aimed at women, like uh, Chicken and Egg, which is a funder of women's films, and Tangerine, which Madhu is going to talk about, um, as well as Sundance's recent women's initiative. Um, there's more docs about women being produced, which I'm always happy to see because we care deeply about the subject of the films that are getting made, and women are getting bigger budgets. Um, and for documentaries, it is better um, than in fiction. Um, as Don Porter said in the, in the description of the panel at a uh, conference last year, uh, better than horrible is that really better. Um, uh, because it is really horrible. Uh, nine percent, women directors are about 9% right now, and it's been between seven and 11% since, just somebody guess, how long has it been that way? Just throw out a year. 1998. Okay, 1998, the number of women directors in Hollywood has been stagnant. Uh, the gender ratio of women to men on screen is two to one, and women only speak in 28.5% of the time on the screen. Let's let that, <laughs> as Joanna said, we have nothing to say, and we know that women don't speak as much as men do, right? <laughs> Um, it's, it's actually extraordinary that women represent 14% of the top leadership in companies in the S&P uh, and we are represented less in Hollywood films. Excluding their art house divisions, the six major studios released only three movies last year with a female director. So this is bad and this is why I call it the worst of time. Um, and if we think that it's better for women in documentary, let me just throw out a couple of statistics. Um, in the Sundance World Doc competition this year, which Sonita actually was lucky enough to win, there were only three of 16 films by women. And that's from all over the world. Um, less than 10% of the Academy Award winners for the last 20 years have been women. Um, and as a very interesting, um, there was a very interesting Facebook posting which I shared with my, with my panelists by an entertainment attorney, Victoria Cook. Um, she just kind of ranted a bit at 
just, just after the first of the year, and it went viral because so many women commented. Um, I was on vacation and missed it, but um, what she talked about was the fact that as we've seen the rise of big documentary, um, in fact, doors have started closing for women rather than opening. Um, so this is, this is not good, and that's why we need to, as Richard was saying, it's unfortunate that we keep on needing to have these panels. Um, as an initiative, Women Make Movies is meant to go out of business. Um, we'll go out of business when women achieve equity, but I fear that we still have a long way off. However, we have five unbelievable panelists today who have accomplished unbelievable feats, even though it is, in fact, more difficult for women filmmakers. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted uh, to have them here. To my very far left is Madhu Chandra. To her left, am I, am, no, to my right is Madhu Chandra. Um, I actually got this wrong. Then Julia Reichert, Heidi Ewing, Barbara Hammer, and you could see their names, but I can't, so you're luckier than me. <laughs> and jo Joanna Rudnick. Um, so uh, as I said, I'm gonna introduce each of them individually, ask them a question to just get us started, uh, and then afterwards we'll have a, a little bit of a discussion. And I haven't told them what order it's gonna be in, and I actually haven't really, couldn't figure it out. So I'm just gonna start way down on the end with Michu. Uh, Michu's films have premiered at the Sundance Southwest and Hot Docs Film Festival on PBS and HBO. She's an alumni of the CPB WGBH Producers Academy, as well as the Tribeca Film Institute's All Access Program. She was honored in the Vilcek's Foundation's New American Film Filmmaker Program. She's taught at the New School in the Graduate Media Studies in New York, as well as at NYU. Um, her films include uh, This Changes Everything, uh, which she was the co-producer of, uh, Out in the Night, a film actually that came out of Women Make Movies Production Assistance Program. And she was a coordinating producer and post-production supervisor on a very important series on PBS, one of the first series on PBS on women ever, ever, uh, called Women, War, and Peace. Um, and I'm gonna tell you one little surprising thing about each of the, each of the panelists. Um, <laughs> And for Mitchu, it's that she actually studied medical anthropology, um, which I just found absolutely fascinating. Um, so Mitchu, please tell us how you got from uh, medical anthropology uh, to making films. And Mitchu now is working with an initiative I mentioned called Tangerine. And please tell us a bit about Tangerine as well. I want to thank you, Debbie, for looking at my website. <laughs> so I'm going to check my Google Analytics later today. You'll be like, one. <laughs> but, um, because that's the only way you would have found that out. Um, but that is surprising. Uh, I, I studied medical anthropology. I, I went to McGill in Montreal, and then I went to Chicago to pursue that and do a PhD in medical anthropology, um, which is large, it's anthropology of the body. And things that I was interested in were um, women and men and how they define the body and how capitalist and science language described male and female bodies. So that uh, aside, so I had a choice to make after graduate school of whether I wanted to become an academic or make films and I had always been inspired by um, independent films like Spike Lee's films, um, El Motivar, it's not exactly independent, but international cinema. Um, and Ang Lee particularly, and artists like Spalding Gray, and they, many of those lived in New York. So I, I left graduate school and moved to New York to see if I could work in the film industry, specifically the independent film industry, because I felt as someone with an Indian American background, that's where I would, could try to get a job. Um, and I worked at Channel 13, which is a public television station in New York, and worked my way up to being a producer pretty quickly, um, and then left to make my first film about Bayard Rustin, who was the man who organized the March on Washington uh, in 1963. Um, so I, I started as an associate producer, but I um, was there for four years. It took a long time. It always takes longer uh, to make a film than you think, and uh, so I became the co-producer. And um, I'll, I'll try to speed it up, but I, I think the arc is going to be relevant to talk about other things later, which is that my career developed very organically um, between working for filmmakers I admired and learning from them, and also working with first-time directors because I admired how much work they had put into a project already, 
and I felt my skill set could help them finish. Uh, so I developed an expertise as a producer of documentaries. Um, I've had several films premiere at Sundance. Um, but if you ever, I sound very confident now, but if you ever ask me at a party, so um, how do you support yourself? Uh, I would all of a sudden just lose you know, all confidence and be like, well, I try not to think about that because it just works out. And then I felt like I was talking to my father or something. Um, but uh, if you don't ask me that, it works out very well because uh, you do one thing and if you succeed, then you meet someone else and then they hire you. And um, largely, my, I have been hired by women uh, in strong positions and I have tried to support women. Uh, and that's also just happened organically because we have the same interests. Um, Brother Outsider could also be seen as a film that relates to medical anthropology because he uh, was an openly gay man during the civil rights era and uh, stayed behind the scenes in terms of his public recognition. He stepped back several key times, which we talk about in the film, uh, to protect the movement. And eventually the movement stood up for him uh, after the March on Washington, so we've um, been able to find a lot more out about his life and legacy. Um, and, to, and it's directed by a woman, and a man, uh, co-directed by two. Um, and now I'm, I'm entering a new phase in my career where I am, I've just joined Tangerine Entertainment, uh, which is a New York-based production company for scripted films. Uh, although all of us, there's three of us women who run the company, and we uh, are primarily interested in funding women-directed films and creating a community for their work. Uh, giving them recognition. So we're here at the Ashland Film Festival to give an award to a woman director. So we'll do that tomorrow at the award ceremony. Um, but we are trying to be part of the solution and to create a structure of networking, um, which as I said, everything that happened in my career was through networking. Uh, and that's something that I think is missing for a lot of people. If you don't have a network, you're not gonna have the support to sustain your career. So that's something we're trying to do with Tangerine. Thank you, that's perfect. Um, I love ending on the note of networking and um, because of that, I'm actually gonna go, she's gonna be surprised, but I'm gonna use that as a segue to uh, introduce Heidi Ewing. <laughs> See, she's surprised, I knew it. I like surprises, it makes things fun. Um, <laughs> excuse me, Heidi and her, Ra uh, and her Rachel. <laughs> Heidi and her partner, Rachel Grady. And by the way, I have to say, it was a little bit hard to find anything about Heidi because everything is about Heidi and Rachel. I actually told them uh, last night or the night before that they are actually the, um, <laughs> the characters in Broad City, Alana and Abby. <laughs> but, yeah, she's not. She's not. <laughs> If one is a little bit more than the other. Anyway, Heidi and Rachel have owned and operated um, Loki Films uh, for, I can't remember, how many, 10 years? About 10 years? 2001, so oh, 15 years. Um, they are Academy Award nominated for Jesus Camp. Um, they have an amazing, amazing run of films to their credit, uh, starting with Boys of Baraka, um, Freakonomics, they were the only women team that had a segment of, of Freakonomics, which was a, an all-star team of filmmakers. Twelfth in Delaware, um, which has been called one of the best films ever on abortion, and I do agree. Uh, it was nominated for Gotham and the prestigious Peabody Award. Um, Jesus Camp, which uh, was Sundance, winning for editing. No? <gasps> then, oh, sorry, sorry, you're right. You're, of course you're right. <laughs> Of course you're right. My God, excuse me. I forgot to return and I didn't Tribeca have, so you know what, that's okay, that's okay. Tribeca can deal with it. Um, but yes, Jesus Camp <laughs> opened at Tribeca and was nominated for an Academy Award. Detropia won at Sundance for editing. Um, and uh, the, their recent film, Norman Lear, Just Another Version of You is Here, which also world premiered at the, as the opening night film of the Sundance Film Festival. So that's just a, you know, just a couple of little good films there. Um, okay, so the surprising thing that I found out about uh, Heidi and Rachel, because of course I couldn't find anything about them individually, is that Loki, the name of their companies, 
is based on the name of Thor's brother, the Norse god of mischief. And I think that makes a lot of sense. It's a goddess. There you go. Um, so actually, Heidi, what I want to, um, one of the things that I've always talked about is that um, one strategy besides networking, and this is the segue back to, to networking, one strategy for women filmmakers is to work in teams. One year I was at, I think it was the year that Detropia was at Sundance, not Jesus Camp, um, and half of the films by women in the documentary se section were made by teams of women working together. So what I want to ask you is, um, how did you and Rachel start making films together? Boys of Baraka, for me, it seemed to explode onto the scene. So I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about your, your path. An explosion that was five years in the making. Is this on? I project it on. No, it's, I don't think it is. Okay. Do you want to put this past that one over? That's embarrassing. How many of you ever take a turn on a microphone? Oh, okay. Um, and I'm the technical one. Uh, so, oh yeah, boys. Uh, what was it? What? <laughs> how did you? How did you and Rachel? How did you start working oh, yeah, okay. together? And how is that as a strategy yeah, we for your were filmmaking? For this dude um, named Jonathan Stack, God bless him, uh, in New York, Gabriel Films. We, um, we, we. I was living in Los Angeles. Actually, uh, look, I'm gonna give you a surprising fact <laughs> because it's nowhere on the internet. <laughs> and now that I successful, I could say it. Um, my first job in the business was at E! Entertainment Television. Yeah. Oh yeah! True Hollywood stories, y'all. That's a surprising fact. It is. Okay. I'm writing it down. Yeah, great. Um, all right, so, okay, yes, yes, yes. We were, um, I was living in Los Angeles. Rachel was living in New York. We had never met. Uh, Jonathan Stack, I cold called him because I had to get the hell out of E! Entertainment Television. And he, uh, I called him, and his wife answered the phone. I don't know, it was an office home situation, and struck up a friendship with his wife over Cue the Music. Um, she said, "Oh, you gotta talk." To I was like, I was trying to reach first call, trying to reach my, trying to reach him, and um, she's like, "He's got something on Scientology that he's looking for a director on, and you know, whatever." But everyone's scared to do it because they like, you know, go through your mail and murder you and stuff. <laughs> so. So I was like, murder, mail, no problem. So, um, and so I said, it's a funny thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be in New York next week. Not true. Um, so I was like, I should stop in. She said that would be great. And so she called me. This is such a long. Okay, I'm gonna go quick. So she, she calls me. He calls me back the next day. Oh yeah, my wife said I gotta call you. So uh, I said, yeah, I'm gonna be in New York, and I bought a ticket like that moment. And. Um, I, I got hired at breakfast when I met him. Uh, he was like, everyone's afraid to make this film. I'm like, I'm not, I've got nothing to lose and no money. <laughs> and, uh, and like no kids or like not, I was like the Scientologist's worst nightmare. I'm like, I'm like, what do you, I told them, I was like, I'm your worst nightmare. I've got no kids, no money, and I'm fucking ambitious. So, uh, so that's what happened. And we made, so, so basically he, he said I could direct it. And, uh, and so then, um, oh yeah, so I was living in Los Angeles, blah, blah, blah. and then he hired Rachel Grady, who like, um, uh, as the as the associate producer, or whatever, in New York, and she like also like cold called him and knocked on the door. You know, she'd been working as a private investigator. So he's like, oh, you'll be the associate producer. Heidi's gonna direct, and we we worked together for like five months before we ever met because she was in New York and I was in LA. So it was phone calls and it was this and that and I would interview and so and so and they did go through my mail and they did follow me and all that stuff happened. So we started prank calling the Church of Scientology <laughs> in the middle of the night and stuff like for fun. And um, and so we were like, it was like a match made in heaven. It was like, we were both totally inappropriate and with nothing to lose. You see why I said they're like Broad City? Yeah. And so um, anyway, so that's how we met and we worked for him for a few years. And honestly, to be to be to be totally honest, he you know mentored women. Uh, he does mentor women because he's because he's not stupid. Because women work harder than men, and he some men figure that out, like Alex Gibney. Alex Gibney, he would. I mean, they're all like or like women. Kirby Dick. I mean, there's many. Yeah. Yes, on and on. The best but he's not smart because he doesn't make Amy co-director. Sorry. Dang. Um, so uh, that's, I'm not going to comment on that. Um, but anyway, so, so there is, you know, he, 
the thing is, like, he was always the front man, and he was like, we would direct the film, and he would get the credit, and like, so I learned, like, my first year in the business, uh, I will never co-direct a film with a man, um, because he'll get all the credit. In fact, it, it was uh, uh, Steve James was like, when are we gonna do something together? I was like, never. You stay away from me. <laughs> uh, and it's, and I tell Michael Moore the same. That they know how I feel. I'm like, what do you? Why? What's in it for me? What's in it for me exactly? When you're like gonna be all over the New York Times, and I'm gonna be. So you got to be careful about about co-directing, uh, and I, I'm saying that with all seriousness. I've had people who will not be named, who are co-directing films with men, approach me in, at Sundance and say, "What's your advice? You know, we're premiering our film tonight," and I say, "You should always take the first question." But remind them, the audience, that you're not like his girlfriend, his wife, or his producer, or his babysitter. Like, and I don't mean to say it's just it is what it is, whatever. So, um, so Rachel and I started directing, uh, you know, working for this for Jonathan for a few years, and then. Uh, a couple years later, we told them we were starting our own company. Uh, we we're going to leave your company, and uh, we hope you support us and are cool with it. And he was all like, we're your clients. And we were like, <laughs> had none. So um, we forgot about that part. Uh, and so basically, this is how we first got Loki Films going. And then I'll stop talking. Um, the, the, we basically pitched a couple of things that were smart, to na uh, I'll say who it was, to National Geographic and uh, come, come some other places. Um, th they got produced without us, we found out a year later. Both things. This is true. And it was, it was a bit high concept. We knew it was our concept. It was the same guy. We put, whatever. What we learned was, what are you going to see National Geographic? You can't do anything. So um, we learned very, very quickly that you have to have, um, to start a company, especially as women, you have to have an idea that you're pitching that nobody else can execute except you. They have to go with you. We only pitch things that are we have access to, that we've already started shooting. Until today, um, if you pick something generic, it's going to a man every time. Why would they ever go with you? They will call, it's like, don't pitch a series on world music. Okay, <laughs> we did that. Um, <laughs> so stupid, it's like, okay. Uh, are you friends with Fela Kuti? No. So. Um, <laughs> So anyway, basically, that's how we, we learned that very early on. We got access to the Kirby Forensic Psychiatric Hospital on Ward's Island in New York City, where people found not guilty by reason of insanity are placed. Rachel got access, um, long story, to the head, who was a woman, the head of the uh, hospital, Gilda Varielli. And so when we would, we would pitch, we went to A&E, and we we're like, we've got this. Nobody else has got it. Want it? You do? Okay, this is how much. So, and, and that's really our modus operandi till today. The Norman Lear thing is another story. We'll talk about it later. Um, but that—that that is our strategy, and um, we co-direct. We do different things. We can get into that later. But that is the origin of our company. Thank you. I think I'm going to start a comedy night out with <laughs> filmmakers, and you're headlining. <laughs> And poor Joanna has to follow that I act. Don't make me follow Hollywood. I know, I know. Somebody has to. But what I said is exactly that. That we can we can we can add a bit of seriousness to it. Um, Joanna Rudnick uh, has worked as a producer, director, and she's the former director of development for Kartemkin, uh, our sister organization, which is also being honored. Um, a little known fact is that Women Make Movies distributed Chicago Maternity Story which was screened last night from Kartemkin years ago. When I first came to Women Make Movies, it was actually in the collection. Um, and no matter, she has written, um, and I did look at everybody's website and a little bit more, uh, no matter where life takes her, she'll always consider Kartemkin her filmmaking home. Uh, she, made it her, she made her directorial debut with the Emmy-nominated film In the Family, a deeply personal film about breast cancer. We actually have two survivors here on the, the panel. Yeah, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> Julia and Joanna. Um, in the Family premiered at Silver Docks in 2008. It was broadcast nationally on, on POV, as well as in nine other countries. It was nominated for numerous awards. Um, before that, she was the supervising producer on Crossfire Hurricane. Um, she also worked with uh, Kartemkin on Prisoner of Her Past and A Good Man. Um, I could go on and on, but I won't. Uh, what I will say is that she has a film here that Women Make Movies is very proud to distribute called On Beauty, uh, which I believe screened last night. And unfortunately, your flight was late and you couldn't be there. But there's going to be another screening today again. 
Um, and my little surprising fact is actually about On Beauty, not so much about Joanna. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, On Beauty is about a fashion photographer named, named Rick Gudati. And Rick is actually the upstairs neighbor of one of my very best friends in New York, and I've known him forever. And you didn't know. I know. Pretty amazing. An extraordinary man with an extraordinary story and an extraordinary film. Um, Joanna, I'd, I'd love you to talk about your career path and how working with organizations like Potemkin has really supported you. Um, yeah. So I started out um, in this world at American Masters at WNET in New York about 20 years ago. And I was in graduate school for science and environmental journalism. And I wanted to be a doctor, and I couldn't quite get it together. And I really loved the art and creativity piece. So I went to journalism school uh, for science and environmental writing and health stories. I really loved health stories and wanted to help humanize health stories and make health information so it wasn't only owned by a certain group of people and we could all relate to it and tell our own stories and share in that information. And while I was there, there was an internship at American Masters, which had absolutely nothing to do with health and science. So obviously I was missing something in my life, arts and culture biography, totally different. And I went and I worked for Karen Bernstein, who was a lovely, amazing, wonderful um, documentary director and producer. I just saw at South by Southwest. And I did my internship, and I worked on a film about Ella Fitzgerald and a few other films there. And I realized what images and sound, and I just fell in love with the whole archival process and um, the idea of telling these stories and pulling in everything. The creativity just blew my mind apart. And then going back to writing felt like I was missing something, like I was missing an arm. But I had a job at Audubon Magazine, <laughs> totally different. I was going to go there and, and write about birds. And, uh, <laughs> and Karen kind of pulled me back in and said, we'd love to offer you a job and stay here. And, and Susan Lacey and Karen and everyone there had kind of um, taken me under their wing. So a lot of women were giving me a chance. And the film that they um, put me on eventually was a film with Anne Makepeace, who's another just wonderful and very generous uh, woman filmmaker who's had a wonderful career. And I co-produced a film with Robert Kappa with her. And we went all over Europe. And it was a beautiful film and a beautiful experience. And um, I just had, it was an all-woman crew, which was so yeah. fun. And we worked with um, a wonderful cinematographer and a wonderful sound woman. And it was so great to be on this all-woman crew. And I had the same musical taste as them. They were all like you know, 20, 30 years older than me. But we shared the musical taste. And um, it was this wonderful experience. And um, I remember saying to Anne, you know, when am I going to be ready to make my own film? You know, and she said, you're going to have a story that you have to tell. And it's going to really burn that hole in you. And I decided to move. I got some news when I was in New York that I had this genetic mutation. And I was really high risk for breast and ovarian cancer. And it was right when, well, you all know now, because Angelina Jolie just put it on the map. But it was when no one was talking about this. I mean, you definitely had not heard about it, probably unless you were affected by it. But I had the BRCA mutation. Mm -hmm. And I had this extraordinarily high risk of developing breast and ovarian cancer. And I was you know, 27 years old and kind of felt like I needed to be back with my family in Chicago to, to make sense of this. And I remember being at Sundance with the Robert Kappa film. And people came up to me and said, why are you moving to Chicago? There's nothing in Chicago for filmmakers. That's like career suicide. You know, why would you do that? And I didn't even know about Kartemkin films. And someone said, hey, Kartemkin Films is here with this film, Stevie. Steve James and Gordon Quinn are here. Um, you know, that's, that's the place to work. And I knew nothing about them and went and researched them. Um, didn't uh, talk to them there, but didn't get myself a job. <laughs> and uh, moved to Chicago, and um, I was stalking Kartemkin. Karen um, was the executive director at the time, and I would just call and say, you know, I really want to work here. And didn't know I could have totally called Gordon. I don't think Gordon's in the audience right now. Oh, he wants to get a massage. Yes, I told him he should get a massage. We're, we're in Ashland. He's getting a massage. But, but as you he know, has, he has a knot right here. That's he's, he's, got, he's got to get that out there. But, but he, he has so much to do with um, sort of the um, room I felt like I was in as a female filmmaker and how lucky I was to have had him truly as a mentor. But um, eventually, I worked on a... Um, a series with Gordon that we were trying to get off the ground. And I went to meet with him and I said, here's a proposal for this film I want to make. It's called In the Family. It's my own personal story. It wasn't my own personal story, I forgot. That's the part. It was a story of other women, because I didn't want to be in the film. Um, and I was too nervous about that. But other people and women and families out there who had this mutation, 
And I wanted to humanize it, not talk only about the medical part about it. What does it mean to have this information? And how do we live our lives knowing we're at this incredible risk of this disease? And uh, that was the film that I pitched to Gordon. And, and he ended up being a mentor and really giving me a place to make it and giving me a voice. The extraordinary thing about him and about Cotemplin was it wasn't the Gordon Quinn film that I came in and helped make about my subject. He said, this is your film. You go make it, and I'm going to support you. And however you make it, it's your film. And that was an unbelievable gift for me as a first-time filmmaker, um, just figuring out how to have a voice um, in this deeply personal subject. Uh, and that, that changed everything for me. It really, and I'll, and I'll never forget, and I will turn this over too, because we all have so many stories in this, but two interesting things about In the Family. I remember them, them saying to me, I was out there when I was making it, people said, well, this is probably a film for Lifetime. You know, you're never going to really get this film. Not that there's anything wrong with that, or we television, but it's a women's film. You know, it was, it's, it's ovarian cancer and breast cancer and genetics. Like, who's going to want to watch that? What man would ever want to watch that? You know, and POV took the film, which was really amazing and sort of proved everyone wrong in that way. And, and, I, and I loved that part of the, the story about it, is that um, it did turn into a film that uh, appealed to many people. I saw many men crying in the audience uh, of that film. And just an extraordinary opportunity. And I could go on and on and on about what came after that in years, but I want to make sure everyone has a has a chance to speak, and I'd love to come back and tell you more about um, that film and what came after, and when I left the Cartemplin room in Bubble, some experiences I had, and what I learned from that side, as well as a woman filmmaker. But I want to make sure everyone speaks. Thanks. I have to tell you all, this is absolutely amazing. I don't think I've ever been on a panel where every person so far has limited themselves to exactly the right amount of time. <laughs> like my aim was to finish this women, on the hour. No, I do, I do women a lot, okay. believe me. Um, and everybody's doing about 10 minutes, which is kind of perfect. Um, so we'll have a half hour afterwards. So I'm trying to figure out which way to go, whether to go to Julia or Barbara. I could make it a, a vote, and it would be really ridiculous, but I won't. Um, I've got Julia up on the screen, so I'll go to Julia next, and we'll end with Barbara. Um, by the way, I, I just have to preface saying that both of these two women um, were my idols when I came to work at Women Make Movies. They were both working then. They were icons then. They're icons now. They are our mothers. And we, even though I'm closer in age to them. Oh, oh, that's, that's, shh, 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 shh. that's, that's my surprising thing. Um, and I say that not in terms of, of age. I say it in terms of what they've been able to accomplish. Um, we owe a tremendous amount to both of them. Without women like them, I don't think any of us would, would be here right now. So thank you both. I'm going to say that just as a little, a little introduction. Julie has been nominated three times for the Academy Award, uh, and she's the winner of a Primetime Emmy Award. She's directed both documentary and fiction. Her films have screened in festivals worldwide, including Sundance, New York, Telluride, Cannes, and Rotterdam. Um, she's got her first five documentaries are all broadcast on public television, including Growing Up Female. And one of the, actually it's not surprising, but I think people need to know that Growing Up Female is one of the few films by women, and I think one of the very few student films that was recently named to the National Film Registry. Um, <laughs> She's a proud co-founder of the distribution co-op New Day Films, which is also a sister organization, a founder of the Independent Feature Project, and uh, a professor of film production. She was a longtime professor of film production at Wright University, Wright State University. Um, she's a mom and a grandma, another surprising fact. Um, and she's a recent recipient of a $50,000 Breakthrough Film Award from Chicken and Egg, which she rightly deserves. So congratulations, Julia. Um, I'd love for you to talk about what's changed in the years since you've been making films. I, I've seen Julia at festivals around the world, or used to see her with a, a little cohort of film students, um, <laughs> taking them around the world. And I always thought of her as, as a mother hen, um, with her little chicken, little chicks behind her. So I'd love for you to give us a sense of, of yeah, your perspective um, all these years. Or what's changed and what hasn't changed. What's changed? Is this one on? Is this the one that's on? Or yeah. one of the ones that's on? Great. Well, I do want to 
get to that. Let me just say a tiny bit. It's not on. Okay, well then let's try this one. Ah, there we go. Okay. Well, I wanted to say, first of all, just a, just a little bit about my own path. I think I sort of fell into the life of an independent filmmaker. Um, you know, I live in the Midwest. When, when you go through, Debbie, uh, a list of all the things I've done, I feel like, was that really me? I mean, I go home to my house with my two cats and my garden, and it sort of is a whole other part of my life than having children and grandchildren and just sort of being a teacher. Uh, so I feel like I really try hard to be just a normal person who also makes films, uh, and particularly from Ohio, from a small town, small city in Ohio. That gives me a particular voice. The idea of, you know, looking for clients and looking for a broadcaster and all that way of thinking and working is, is new on the scene for someone like me. It's something that we didn't even think about in the early days of women making films, which really was part of the women's liberation movement uh, in the beginning. It really, you know, I consider myself an activist. I came out of that idea. And by the time I guess I, I finished the third film, I kind of said, gee, I guess, I guess I'm a filmmaker. But it wasn't the center of my life. I think we all, back then, it's part of the formation of New Day and part of what we did, we, words like, old-fashioned words like solidarity, sisterhood, uh, taking the long view, patriarchy, like not using patriarchal models. Uh, you know, we could go on about that. Th those were like formative ideas for me and have continued to be throughout my, in my entire life is speaking, helping give voice to just regular people and particularly women and particularly thinking about the notion of class. Uh, Gender, yes, race, yes, they're all very important, but we don't talk very much about class. Uh, and let's not forget that gender and class intersect a lot in America. If you think about it, uh, women still only earn 78 cents to the dollar. Let's not forget that. Women are underpaid in so many parts of life. And you know, you take like a woman gets divorced. Her, her income goes down, her life goes down, right? We all know that the husband's, the ex-husband's goes up. So class and, class and gender are really relate in many ways. Um, so anyway, uh, change. Um, let's talk, let's just a minute about, so back in the day, you could walk into a lab and ask about your work print and they assume you're somebody's secretary uh, as opposed to that you're the filmmaker. You really had to kind of take a deep breath and stand up straight and say, no, it's my film. I'm not here as, a, as, as a, an assistant to somebody else. Um, so I have taught film, you know, young filmmakers from Ohio for the past, well, 28, 30 years, okay? That's how I've managed to survive as an independent filmmaker, right, is I have another source of income and Health insurance, which you know, if you have kids and whatnot, you really have to think about that. Um, it's another reason to live in Ohio. We always use the phrase, keep your nut low. Do you guys know what that means? Yeah. Okay, keep your nut low. And that's a, a good reason, along with having a voice of sort of average people, is you can actually survive and make the films you want. I, honestly, I don't think I've ever started a film with any funding at all. I, that, may, that may not be exclusively true, but overall, we sort of go out and start making a film and then later see if it's something and, you know, you could get a broadcaster, you can get funding somehow, but we sort of follow our, what seems to make sense for our lives. So 25 or 30 years ago, teaching, honestly, there were no women students. Honestly, there were no women students in our film school in Ohio. Every few years, we'd get like one. Right. And I will also say, they were mostly working class guys. They were mostly these kind of rough hewn guys who like loved, I don't know, um, Sylvester Stallone films, who loved those kind of action films. I, I, that's a lot of what I got to work with. <laughs> um, but now, I will say last year, now this is leaping forward and I think there are reasons for this. All, all the films that were chosen 
to be directed and that were directed were all by women. Right? And there are more, more women in the program than men in general now. So why is that? Um, I would say, I'll just end with this. One thing is we got a second woman professor. So it wasn't just all guys and me, which is hard. If you're the only one over all those years, it's hard to, you know, recruitment. We specifically, I went to a ton of high schools and recruited, tried to speak as a woman and how important it was that we get women to come. And yes, you can do it. Um, and the new professor, who was 26 years old, when I was like in my late 50s by then, she started a group called Kino Fem, which was so great. And she started nurturing these w women students that were there and meeting with them and having them air their problems um, and making films as that little group. So I have always felt that idea of solidarity and sisterhood even down to today, even though it's an old-fashioned word, women hire women, right? Women will support women, and we still, we still need to be doing that. I'm so thrilled to see a, a huge audience of women here today. So I guess it's, that's a halfway decent answer to what you asked. <laughs> Much more than a halfway decent answer. And now I have to correct yet another mistake that I made, and I deeply apologize, because we don't have two survivors on the panel. We have three. Yeah, exactly. Barbara Hammer is yes. currently battling, yeah, right. <laughs> battling the, the big C. Yeah. I, it's, it's amazing. They're incredible. But what a, what a commentary on the state of this country in terms of, of health that a majority of the women sitting here. Um, Wow. Uh, Barbara, 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 Barbara. I, I just, you know, I told Barbara coming up here in the car that I remembered the first time I met her and she was amazed. And I said, you were wearing red. And she said, my red jumpsuit. And I said, yes. 1985. That Barbara is an icon is actually understating it. Um, she's made more than 80, 80 moving image works in a career that spans 40 years. She is considered a pioneer of queer cinema. Oh. She's had more accolades, awards, retrospectives than I could possibly even begin to list. I'll just, I'll just list a couple. She was honored with a month-long retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art in 2010. Um, her two most recent films won the Teddy Award for Best Short Films at the uh, Berlinale, Maya Darren Sink, and Generations. She's also a visual artist, and her work is represented by the gallery by a gallery in Germany. She's had solo exhibitions of her collages and drawings. Um, her films, again, are too numerous to count to list. Nitrate Kisses was chosen for the Whitney Biennale. My two favorites, in which Women Make Movies actually distributes very early films, Dyke Tactics and Double Strains, two yes, beautiful awesome. experimental films. Tender Fictions, another film we distribute. History Lessons out in South Africa, My Babushka. It, it's just way, way, way too long to even list. Um, she was a Fulbright Fellow. Um, she also received the first Shirley Clark Avant-Garde Filmmaker Award from New York Women in Film and Television. Uh, Welcome to This House, a film on the Homes and Loves of Poet Elizabeth Bishop is playing here at the festival. And my surprising fact about Barbara Hammer, which I just learned on the drive here from Medford, is that Barbara was married to a man for nine years. <laughs> <laughs> the queer icon. Um, it is. Yeah. <laughs> In any event, I'm, I'm asking Barbara to talk about how has she managed to sustain herself over such a long career uh, and have, has been able to make so many films. And I, I don't know that I need to say it, but I will anyway. There are probably only a handful of women in the entire world that can count that number of films to their credit. Debbie. <laughs> 
I think you should never speak to Debbie before a panel. <laughs> I never knew she was taking notes. <laughs> she did ask if she could call me Babs today at lunch. I said, absolutely not. <laughs> and she didn't. Yes, I was doing research. That's why I was married to a heterosexual man for nine years. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the other clue to getting ahead is sit next to a great speaker and a comic herself <laughs> for cues. Oh, it's been a long, wonderful road and a wonderful life that I've had. I've been uh, honored and so lucky that I came out as a lesbian. At the same time, I started making films. I already had an MA in English literature, and I didn't really like teaching English 1A. I felt like there was something inside me that I needed to express. That, that was really the beginning. And I thought about painting, but then I looked at the kinds of course descriptions for painting, and it was forming content, how to mix color, and yet for documentary, it was you know philosophy of Russian film. And many more exciting ideas. And um, I decided I was going to go into filmmaking. And in the first two and a half years, while I was getting my MA in film, I made 13 films. None of them were for a class. These were films that I had to express. There were films about subjects like menstruation, where I made a comedy called Menses. I had women twirling tampaxes coming, <laughs> coming out of a, a Rite Aid store. <laughs> You know, and I had them menstruating with, fro with um, hard-boiled eggs above the University of California. It was real important to me to go to a hill above this major university and have all nude women standing in a triangle, you know, the pubis, and drop these eggs on count and then pro pour dragon blood on them. You know what I mean? The, this and, and have a slumber party beforehand so they could each figure out their script. Yeah. So Lady Macbeth, she just tried to wash off the blood all the time. I mean, you know, somebody got wrapped as a Tampax and rolled down the hill. It was like, it was community-based. This early 1970s lesbian movement in the Bay Area was is a wonderful time to be a part of it and to have a crew ready to jump in the back of the station wagon and do anything. Um, and then it went on, it went on and on and on, and nobody would show the films. In terms of major institutions, yes, women's film distribution companies would. But with the Museum of Modern Art, I felt I was a visual artist. And I kept piling up the films as they were made on a curator's desk. And, you know, never, never, never. And then I took women out of the films, and it was just me behind the camera. Maybe I'll get a show that way. You know, it was, like, incredibly difficult. And finally, I was able to not only have the screening at MoMA, but I was also able to go to Sundance with my first feature film. So Nitrate Kisses is an essay documentary. I really want to shake up the documentary form. I think we're stuck. Okay, so it's a great new world and we have a lot of finance and we have money behind us and women know now how to swing and get it. But let's move the genre forward. Do you know what I mean? Like Tangerine has moved forward in terms of an experimental narrative. Why can't we go further with a documentary film? And that doesn't mean just to have docudrama. Like, Watch Welcome to This House, and you'll see Elizabeth Bishop, who's been dead since 1979, explore the homes that she's lived in around the world, because I feel like the architecture shapes the artist. We make according to where we live, not only cultural geography, but also the circumstances of our small New York studios, or do we get a soundstage? That really makes a difference in terms of production. Um, so, Jeff Gilmore, who was running Sundance at the time, came up to me after he'd seen Nitrate Kisses, and he was shaking, and he went to a corner to talk to me, and whispered, I want to show it in Utah, <laughs> at the Sundance Film Festival. <laughs> well, of course I was thrilled. You know, and, and I was honored that he would take a risk. And these, this was the early days of Sundance. This was, the film was made in 92. It premiered at Sundance in, it must have been 93, January 93. And 
he took a risk, I took a risk in making the film, so together you had, like the Ashland Film Festival can take a bigger risk. I don't see much experimental work here. And yet experimental work is something that informs all our work. Even we're, getting, we're working for major companies or forming our own. This is where many ideas are born. Um, it's where many women get a chance because the film costs are low. Why did I continue for so many years beyond Sundance? Because my mom believed in me. That's really it. My mom thought that I was great and I believed her. Why not? <laughs> Um, how did I continue? You know, I don't have a production company. Um, it's me who does almost everything. Um, believe in myself and going for arts grants, you know, and also starting the film before I get the grant. And you need the film for the sample anyway. You know, so Elizabeth Bishop, Welcome to This House, was funded by the Guggenheim Fellowship. Well, I wanted that film and when I, that grant for years. And when I got it, people said, about time. That was really the major response that I heard. I must have applied 15 times before. Little did I know that Edward Hirsch, that runs the Guggenheim Fellowship, is a poet himself. And that Elizabeth Bishop is, you know, I went to the office for the celebration and behind his desk there was every book ever written on Elizabeth Bishop. I chose the right subject without knowing it. <laughs> But, you know, I also did my research and talked to people who had gotten the grant. How did they get it? Who were the recommenders? Send me your descriptions. Send me your budget. So I had women helping me, too, from behind the scenes. And I shaped my grant accordingly. Um, so we can all help each other. I'm here for you. Thank you for being here for me. Wow. As a moderator, I couldn't ask for a better panel. You guys rocked. Um, I, I just want to um, say that I took a couple of notes, and what I've learned from listening to you um, is find supportive men mentors. This is in no particular order. Right. Work with women. Never co-direct with men. <laughs> be a stalker. Be persistent. <laughs> dream. Dream is really important. Um, make films that only you can make. Um, don't use patriarchal models. Uh, keep your nut low. <laughs> Work in solidarity with other women. Every single one of you talked about how women help women, and actually the statistics prove it out. If a film has one woman producer out of, you know, you can have an executive producer, a producer, a coordinating producer. There's one woman producer on a film. It's six times more likely to have another woman in one of the six key positions, which is director, writer, editor, cinematographer, director, producer. So it, the facts bear it out. Women do help women. Um, and to have the last one I said, didn't really, women hire women. Um, and have great moms that believe in you. Um, before we open it up to the audience, <coughs> excuse me, I did ask all the panelists, although I thought that I sent an email on Wednesday, I think, but it didn't get to anybody till yesterday. My mistake. Um, but I asked them to think about um, if there were three things that they could think of that would really change things for women filmmakers. I know I've just kind of made a list. And if you just if, if there's nothing that you can add to it, that's fine too. We'll just go to, um, we'll go to questions. But I just wanted to ask you, because I did ask you in my, my email, um, you know, what would it look like if there was really equity for women in filmmaking? Um, what would the documentary field look like? What would our films look like? How would, you lives, how would your lives be different? Um, so yeah. Or, or you can answer another question. I'll give you two. I'll give you two choices. Um, do you think that we're at a tipping point right now? Because a lot of people say that with all of the recent conversations and press about the inequality, both in gender and race, um, in Hollywood, especially around the Academy Awards, that we're at a tipping point and that it's going to get better. So you can choose either one or neither, and just say what, whatever you want to say. Why don't you use that mic over there? Yeah, that one's for okay. you. I just was making a list when you guys were talking because I think it's really interesting who's supporting women. I made a list of everyone who's ever given me a large sum of money in documentary. Here are their names. Dylan, that's a woman. 
Dylan, Laura, Lois, Jahan, Kara, Orlando, Libby, Susan, Dan, Sheila, Molly, Sarah, Michael. Wow. Now that's my whole career. Wow. Like big sums of money, like over, yeah. over 250. Um, the, I'm making a, a narrative film now, and these are who I have meetings with in the next uh, nine days. Phil, Ted, Bob, Lars, Ted, David, uh, Mark, David, um, Alejandro, Micah, Alex, Michael. That's real. That is amazing. It's, I'm not surprised at all, but it's so fantastic that you wrote no, all I just of that I've down. I've never done that in my life. It's like yeah. I have to raise money now in the, for a narrative. Yeah. That's why I think narratives, what is it, 4% versus 9% in documentary. Um, anyway, I've never done that before, and that was just, wow, there's a problem right there. Yeah. It's by, it's, by the way, it's the exact same thing if you look at distribution. You know, if you look at smaller companies, um, documentary companies, it's mostly women. If you look at fiction companies, it's mostly men. And, it, and then we have Rotten Tomatoes, which is 18%. 18% of the writers for Rotten Tomatoes are women. 18. That I don't know means... if you saw that article about, I, I don't know if it was Manola Dargis who did it or not, about um, the words used to describe um, uh, films directed by women. They yeah. did a comparison of, of, of the words chosen. Yeah. Um, and I wish I could think of the words right now. That would now, be a great list, another great shocking. list. Shocking. Yeah. Heartfelt, Heartfelt. From the gut. Warm, uh, charming, personal. Yeah, personal. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Intimate. Yeah. I think yeah. the big, I think the big, um, the big thing that should happen, and I, I, I'm a big person who always says the same thing about this because I mean it, male mentorship. It's about getting to the men in power and saying, don't you have a mother? Don't you have a wife? Don't you have a daughter? Don't you have a daughter? Don't you have a daughter? It's about, <laughs> it's about that. It's about, what, you know, if there's a list of five interns that, you, that are going to work on your production um, or camera ACs or whatever, if you look, you know, if equally qualified, you just got to go with the lady. I mean, it's just about getting to these men and getting them on these panels and getting them to sit up here and, and say, listen, are you going to do this? Like the Clinton Foundation does, you know? It's like, I commit that I'm going to, like, public. Um, it's not shaming. It's like, come on, guys. Come on, brother. I've raised money from men. I, I do well. It's not like I've not raised money from men. I know to talk to men. It's fine. But I, it's like, hey, come on, man. Join. Let's. It's really being inclusive and trying to get them to be part of this. I, I do that. For me, personally, that is my number one, and I'm... Not against the sisterhood. I love it. I'm in it. I want men to, I think male mentorship, they have to rise to the occasion. They've got the power. They've got the money. Let's have them join us, please, um, and, and have them part of the solution. I think we're going we're gonna to go to questions, If unless anybody wants to add anything from the panel. Wikipedia is really important. Wikipedia is totally, totally dominated by men, and that is the place that students go to get information. And if you just want to just, this is just an interesting thing. I was teaching at Rutgers University last year, and I had my students, the first assignment I gave them was to look at a website called the Women Film Pioneers website at Columbia University, which is a wonderful website of pioneering women filmmakers, and then look them up online and look at the Wikipedia entries and compare them. The Wikipedia entries were all about their marriages, their divorces, their personal lives, their husbands, <clears throat> as opposed to their accomplishments in film. All the way back there, I think we have a roam, well, we were supposed to have a roaming mic. We do. So all the way back there. We have about 25 minutes for questions, Katie, so that's touching good. on um, what you just said, going on the list of women, of the people who have contributed to you or given you significant amount of money over your career, and the nine meetings that you have coming up in the next I'm week. Sorry, I missed the beginning of it because we didn't have issue. I'm sorry. That's she's okay. Asking, she's just asking, given that you, the, the long list yeah. that you the just... The list that you yeah. just went over. I would really love to follow that journey and, and see what pops and what progress happens and how you actually end up funding this feature. You have meetings coming up with a whole list of men. Let's, you know, they live so much She wants to film those meetings. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, well, you know, they live so much in the spotlight here, and we're asking them to share. I'm going to so get the money. The light on them. I'm going to get the money. I'm going to make the film. 
I oh, promise yeah. you that. No, I, I I would like to follow that too. I I will be happy to report back. Next yeah, year. can can you can you blog it? Can you Facebook it? Can you no, tweet it? No. No. That would be a really bad thing for her to do, honestly. No, no. I mean, that's exactly. I, I'm sorry. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to protect her here. That that would be a really really difficult thing to do. But I think reporting back next year after it's over and after she's raised the money, totally makes and sense. And to be fair, they might not connect with the material. I mean, I'm not. I was. I'm not delusional. It's like, you know what I mean? Every there's that's very hard to prove bias. It is hard to prove bias. It's like my movie is a Spanish language feature. It's it's got commercial uh, uh, roadblocks. So, and that's a fact. So, it's just like that's why it's so murky, guys. It's very hard to prove it. We know it, but it's hard to prove it because filmmaking and storytelling is is obviously subjective. And so, I think it's it's that's a challenge. Thank you. Wonderful panel. I just want to go off of a few things that, that everyone had as a theme, which is matriarchy, patriarchy, that we as women know how to be inclusive, and we need to teach men how to do that. And also, the other part is what you said, Heidi, that don't let that other person take the question first. We as women also know how to be kind and compassionate, but our kindness and our compassion is sometimes not speaking up for what really matters. And I just want you guys to talk a little bit about whoever wants to answer it, that it's our obligation as women to speak up and not be polite. Well-behaved women rarely make history. So, and all of you have touched on that same theme. I'd just like to hear how that works for you, feeling that you can be a mother and kind and also you don't have to stand behind and not be in the spotlight. I want to address that and then certainly want to hear from the, the other panelists. And I'm just so honored to be on this panel. I never said that, but such amazing company. Uh, when I went to uh, Los Angeles to produce a, a, a big documentary after being in at Cartemquin, uh, I watched the male director advocate for himself and do his contracts. And I was just like, my mouth was on the floor. And I realized that I just didn't even know how to advocate. I'd never negotiated for money for myself ever. I just didn't, that's also watching you know, and learning like this is how you have to talk and how you have to respect yourself and how you have to look at your contracts and you can't just sign them and you have to look at the rights and the film rights and all of this stuff and you have to actually advocate for yourself. And that was really a profound experience for me um, was that realizing how I had to develop that voice. The other thing I noticed when I look at these statistics out here is that women producers are much higher. If you look at it, I think women producer roles, it's about like 25%, a little higher, but directors is at that 9% stagnant. And, not, and I think it's very important. I think women are, a lot of really uh, powerful filmmakers have these wonderful women producers who take care of all the details and take care of everything for them. And I think it's also very important to play that role of you know, being able to be the director and being able to talk for the film. And if you're the producer, you had a lot of, to do with making that film. And you should be out there and you should be answering questions and you shouldn't be in the shadow and you shouldn't be in the background of all of that. And I think that's what I, what I learned, and that's why I also really wanted to have my own film, because I wanted to be able to speak about it and speak about that experience and not have to just be in the background. So I think we need to also get that number up to where we are as producers. And when you're talking about the 10 year, I was thinking all these amazing women have these great male producers <laughs> supporting them, you know, and we're out there, and that number goes up. It's equal. And that's what I'd like to see. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in there and just say one of the things that I really want to try to work on is encouraging men producers to produce for women directors. Because I spend most of my year at pitching forums around the world, documentary pitching forums, and it is, you've never seen it yet? With a woman director. I can name about five of them, including Roast Beef in England that did Havana Markings film, Afghan Star. Um, there's Frederick Gurton in Sweden who produces four women directors. Jonathan, excuse me, Jonathan, Jonathan Stack. Jonathan Stack did. He did. So there are, but the point, but your, your point is so right. It is so rare. However, the reverse is all too common with women producing with male directors. And we need to change that, uh, that ratio. It's extremely, extremely important as well as as encouraging women to get producers. Because the other thing you see is women trying to do it all themselves. And there are some that have been very, very successful. But it actually really helps to say, I 
need a producer. I want a producer. I deserve a producer so that I can be the creative force and somebody else is taking care of business for me. And that's, I shouldn't be talking to those. I think that's great. I would just, I think that's a great idea, Debbie. I want to respond to your question. How can we change? And I think we can change ourselves in our social conversations. I think we um, are too nice to each other. I'm just saying we meet each other here at the festival. I mean, I've never been in a city where so many people said hello to me. With They don't even know me, you know? And so maybe what I need to say is, you don't know me. Would you like to know me? And maybe we need to have discussions that aren't based on niceness. And we need to start small so that we learn that this can be OK and that we can change society. And it's not going to happen just with producers and directors and this big, we need to talk to each other. Yes, I have cancer. No, it's not breast cancer. It's ovarian cancer. And I've lived with it for 10 years. This is a big, um, I've had a long remission. Um, you know, this is something we can say to one another. We can share. So let's start there. I think that first question was like the hit question touches so many topics and I just wanted to compliment um, what was said before about how do we get men to mentor women and I, I also want to expand it from women and their personality that we're nurturers. I don't know if yes we are nice and we are heartfelt and we are nurturers and we hire women um, but we're also business women. Like we're hiring women because they're capable and because they're smart and we know they're gonna work harder. Um, and I, I read this sort of unrelated but related article in the New York Times recently about uh, how 92% of patent owners are men. And they did a research, and I was like in very intrigued because now I finally read the New York briefings that I get in the morning. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm learning so much. but. But they do that largely because they have the networks and the investors, the networks and the social um, connections to people who will invest in their ideas to make it happen. And that's exactly what I think we need. It's not, um, here's another idea I, I thought about on this panel is just from all of these comments. I don't think that it's an inherent desire to harm women, that men aren't hiring women. There's also something we haven't talked about, which is that people hire their own kind. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was an article in the New York Times again. Uh, that's the only paper I read, <laughs> as it, it sounds like. Um, but there, in, in January, there was an article about women in film, and they interviewed 40 prominent women in Hollywood um, and different, and also documentaries. And I spent, it was really long, and I spent all this time reading it in parts and studying it. And, um, you know, what I l learned from that is people hire their own kind. Uh, and they would see themselves go to Sundance once, the second time, feature director, woman. And then another man that they had met at the festival is now producing, like, The Hunger Games or, or something like that. That's yeah, not exactly. Yeah, it's the story of, of um, yeah. Because they, maybe their film wasn't even as good. It didn't win. But they get connected through these networks. So how can we expose that inherent bias and not say, oh, you hate women? It's not because you hate women. It's because you're connecting with these guys. So how do we make you aware of that? And, um, and it, you know, I think that we are at a tipping point because there is this zeitgeist conversation happening in the New York Times and in, uh, at festivals when you have these panels. Um, and it'll hopefully get written up. It'll be on the internet for people to look at and to participate and to listen to this conversation that we're having. And I think if we can just look at that inherent desire to hire our own kind and expand that, that's how we do it. It's not that people, um, they hire men to be on this panel because there aren't other filmmakers, it's because they didn't think of it. So if we just make this a broader Great. I just want to, this lady's been trying to get in a question, and then Heidi, I'll go to you. But. Thank you. My query, after, especially after this last comment about having a broader conversation, is would you please, especially Deborah, with your data and your statistics that you have been scattering and giving throughout would you please make a TED.com YouTube video 
so that the whole world can know those statistics. And the rest of you on this panel, I hope each and every one of you will also post your own history, your story on TED.com or make a documentary featuring yourselves and speak the truth to power. Um, last year during the talk backs, I forget who said it, but one of the producers had made a comment that a lot of the movies being made out there are being made by male producers. And the script they use, the hero of the fiction or you know, the feature film, they simply switch out and put the hero to be a woman. And this past year, movies like Allegiant came out. So these are war minds. These are basically putting the women into the role of warriors. And that needs to be addressed because if we want a culture of peace, we have to stop promoting a culture of war and addressing women's issues. And also... Thank you. Sorry, did you put, did, is there a specific question or else I'd love to Well, get my question is, would you that. please do that? Would yeah. you please <laughs> post? Would you please post on TED.com? I think, sure. And get TED to ask us. That would be yeah, really great. Um, but I think I think everybody here is very committed to getting, to making sure that what they talk about is is getting out there as widely as possible. Heidi, did you want to say something before? Okay, in the back, and then here. Sorry, I didn't see you, Helen. Don't be upset. Thank you so much. This is this is so rich in what we've learned today. And one I wanted to go back to because several of you mentioned pitching. For those of us who have only had one film and a short doc at that. How do we pitch cold pitch? <laughs> uh, and, and do you have to actually have the film partially made, as someone alluded to, before you do that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Usually, is this one on? Yeah. Um, you, we're, we're in this exact dilemma right now with two films. Um, you pretty much have to have a pretty substantial clip. It doesn't, it's not, I don't know if you would tend to agree, but it's not enough just to have a great description or great access uh, or have a track record, you know, and all that. You really kind of have to show something. Yeah. And that's, that's tough, but you sort of have to, to me, you sort of have to commit to the idea and get out there and document it, whatever it is, or, or get actors together to do a scene before you're going to get funding. Of course, there are exceptions. Yeah, no, but that really, this one's really loud. That's, that's absolutely true. You really do have to have, have something. Um. But it doesn't have to be um, exactly from the film that you're making. As For instance, I use somebody else's house to show a 1970s home that Elizabeth Bishop lived in in Brazil. Um, I, you can use um, lots of things that won't end up in the final film. They want to see your style as well as your concept. Yeah. So don't be inhibited by that. You can do that with the kinds of cameras that are available for, you know, way under $1,000, you know. So make your sample and make it strong. Yeah. That's what we look at. I've been a judge, too, so I yeah, know it's, that's the way it works. It's the idea and the, the access, at least in nonfiction, that's important. You know what I find hard, though, is who to pitch, to, who's the right one to pitch to? And that world is changing, like, every year. Like, a few years ago, we had no Netflix, Hulu. We had... It was pretty much HBO and PBS, and then England or whatever. And it's, there's, a, there's just new companies exactly. coming up, England, with all their various channels. Um, but you, it's a moving target, you know, who you should pitch to and who's interested in what. And it's totally worth doing a lot of research and talking to other people who are maybe further down the road than you are to figure out who's a good match. Also, yeah. I just want to add, if you said short, if it's affordable, if you can do it with your iPhone or and a decent microphone or something, if it's your first film, I would just make it. Yeah. Or change your concepts slightly and make it shorter and make it more doable because that's your calling card for your next film. It's very hard to get your first film finance, period, even with a clip, even with a thing. I mean, I don't, you know, so it's just like if you can get it done with your friends or whatever, get it done. And then that's what, I, what my advice to you. 
and let the grass grow if possible, or put that one on the shelf and do something that's more manageable and more achievable in a short amount of time. You have to have multiple ideas if you want to have a career in film, all the time, a many. A lot of things will fly, not go. You'll pitch it, they don't like it. It's the wrong time, it's not going to happen. The, the key is to look at the body of work. I'm interested in the body of work in my lifetime. And certain things get on hold and get moved and get shuffled around because it's about the whole repertory of work that you do. So maybe you want to consider some other ideas that, that you can achieve and you can get made. Thank you. <clears throat> Another thing um, I was thinking of while I was reflecting on what you said is a way that we as women can control the narrative is by actually, if you have a moment, to write about your process, to take control of the story of how you make what you make, especially Barbara, when you talk about what you make, anyone who's working in new forms, we are the ones who have to explain it to the world and make sure that we write about it and we don't make it mysterious and we don't make it strange because we're the ones who have to make everything transparent for each other to help each other, not just in terms of process, but the story of what we make. And this is what I think we've heard today. And not many people ever know this story. I'd like to recommend my book. It's called <laughs> <laughs> Hammer, Making Movies Out of Sex and Life. It's published by the Feminist Press a few years ago. I was entertained by all your educational backgrounds and all the diversity that came into informing your um, visions. And I was just wondering, as a first-time filmmaker, what you see as the best educational opportunities to, that you would suggest to someone to learn the technical aspects of filmmaking? Um, how many of you have been to formal film school? Any of you? I, I'd like to hear it. <laughs> I think that's awesome. <laughs> Don't waste your money on film school. Um, you'll never get out of debt. Um, and come, kids come through NYU all the time and they work for me. And Harvard and Berkeley and whatever. They don't know shit uh, about the technical. I, we have to teach them everything. I'm not kidding. Uh, it's like, I, it's working for other people. Find people you admire, work for them, intern for them. It's, it's, this is an apprenticeship craft. Yeah, this is like furniture making. This is what this is. So it's about apprenticeship. I used to say to Gordon at Cartemkin all the time, you know, I need to go to film school. He's like, you don't need to go to film school. This is film school. You know, get out and do it. And I think something that was great at Cartemkin is you had to do something, you know, go out and learn sound. You know, you can't, you know, yeah. you learn so you find someone and volunteer for them. You know, that's really the best way, and I agree that it is an apprenticeship craft. Yeah. Volunteer, you do a PA, right? And you ask a lot of questions. I want to throw something else out that, um, commenting on what you had asked and also going off of that. You know, this is, I love the furniture metaphor, by the way. I think it's really true. But this is also a business of relationships, and networking and meeting people is so important. Um, coming to events like this is really important. The person sitting next to you could actually be somebody that is going to be helping you at some point in your career, and I could tell many stories like that. But there's also something called, what I call, getting into the pipeline, which is something that we try to help the filmmakers that we work with do. Um, and what that means is getting them to places where groups of industry professionals are so that they have the opportunity to get exposure for their projects. So initiatives like the Sheffield Meat Market in England or the Independent Feature Project, um, I don't know what it's called, Independent Film Week, or Tribeca um, Networking Meetings, which is happening next week. These things do happen in New York and LA and big cities. They don't generally happen in, in smaller places, but there are fantastic people that are here for this festival. And getting to know them is going to really help you along the way. If you come talk to me afterwards, I'd like to recommend something for you. I think we have time for one more question. And this, this woman here is so excited. Yes, it's you. It's you. And then I'm sure that everybody on the panel would be happy to answer questions individually for a little bit. 
Thank you all so much. I'm totally in hog heaven over here. Um, we're making our first um, documentary, and um, we're, we've started to think about um, story structure. And you know, there's like the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell and all of that. But we're looking in the, the heroine's journey and sort of, you know, you've got um, testosterone dominant and oxytocin dominant and different perspectives and socialization. And I'm just wondering, in terms of content and story structure, if you found ways that women tell stories um, differently than men, um, or look at the, I mean, obviously we look at the world differently, but in terms of the story, you know, the narrative, whether it's a documentary or fiction, if you might comment on how those differences That's are. That's the panel for next year. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a big subject. Um, does anybody want Anything to comment small. a little bit? Small details, we notice everything. Um, hidden histories, they're there. People are always surprised what they find in my films. Um, looking at the way objects also can tell a narrative. Um, as I already mentioned, architecture. Um, there's much more beyond us, the ego. I'll just tell you something. And I, I just want to say one thing. You're the moderator. No, of course. No. Um, Go right ahead, Heidi, please. I just want to say that overall, making documentaries, uh, women just do it better. Well, I cannot end on any better note than that, so I will keep silent and just thank these amazing, wonderful women. Thank you so much.